I'm here with former Secretary of State, former National Security Advisor, Condoleezza Rice, and she's written two memoirs, one of her early life and the second about her eight years in the Bush administration. And I'd just like to start, you seem to be the, the perfect American success story, uh, overcoming great odds. Um, you write about the extraordinary, ordinary lives of your parents. And based on all that you've seen with them and the way they raised you, what, what advice do you have for parents who are hoping to raise the future Secretary of State? <laughs> well, my parents were indeed extraordinary, but probably the most important uh, ingredients uh, from my point of view, obviously, it was unconditional love. Uh, they didn't ever hint that anything that I did would ever make them love me any, any less. But then they had high standards and high expectations as well. Uh, my folks once told me, as all of their friends told their kids, you have to be twice as good. And I now say to people, yes, that was in the context of segregated Birmingham, but it's actually not bad advice, uh, whoever you are and wherever you're growing up. And then finally, they gave me every opportunity that could even remotely be called educational. And so I think the combination of love and high expectations and opportunity really came together in a very, very good parenting package, if you will. And, and you're right. I know that your father and your grandfather, I believe, were Presbyterian ministers. That's what, right. what role did faith play in your uh, development? Faith is, is still and uh, was been a major part of uh, our lives and of my life. Uh, I went to church every Sunday, and I still do. But most importantly, it gives you uh, a way to think about your future that says, I'm going to be all right. And that means that you can take risks. It means you can be a little less uh, concerned about exactly where am I going along this uh, pathway, because I really do put my faith uh, in God. Dr. Rice, switching gears, we're, we're here in Music City, yes. and clearly piano has been a, a big part of your life and your early uh, development and education. And you were majoring in music and piano, and you played with Yo-Yo Ma, you played with, for the Queen of England, so that's been a big role. And education, in K-12 education, I know, is one of your passions as well. Yes. And as we look at budget cuts, one of the early cuts seems to be the arts. Yes. And I'm just curious about your role. I know for me growing up, music was so important in teamwork and discipline. Yes. What, how do you feel about K-12 education and music? Well, it absolutely makes my skin crawl when people say, well, music, the arts, extracurricular. Because I believe that it's a, an integral part of a broad uh, curriculum that can make kids broader people. Uh, I'm a great believer that in, in performing, whether it's music or art or dance, you also gain a certain confidence that you can't gain in any other way. Perhaps you or friends of yours, certainly I did, you had to stand up when you were four or five and do those speeches. <laughs> <laughs> and sooner or later you learn that you can do that, and even if you make a mistake, you can still get up the next day and you can keep going. Um, I just think it's a wonderful way for, for kids to have a feeling uh, that they're achieving something, and indeed I now play a fair number of benefit concerts so that uh, children's music programs can be funded in these, uh, these tough budgetary times. Amazing. Well, just like music and notes, words are also very powerful, and I know words in, in foreign relations are incredibly important. You don't want to say the, the wrong words at the wrong time. Uh, but I'm thinking about words that were very powerful powerful to you and kind of inspired you. And I, I was thinking about your Aunt Teresa yes. and how uh, she she had a PhD yes. and some of the words that she used that actually inspired you yes. to finish. Well, she ultimately inspired me by saying, uh, you know, if you don't do your PhD, because I really wasn't certain, she said, if you don't do your PhD, you'll never know how far you could have gone. And I look back on that because Aunt Teresa and I actually didn't have a particularly close relationship. In fact, she was a professor of Victorian literature, and when I was about eight, I went to visit her, and I, she was reading A Tale of Two Cities uh, by Dickens. And I said, Aunt Teresa, have you read that book before? She said, I have read this book 25 times. And I thought, what a boring way to spend your life reading the same book 25 times. So I almost didn't become a professor and a PhD, but she was the one who really spoke those words that, uh, that challenged me to think about a future when I hadn't given everything a chance. Words are powerful. In, in reading in your second book, the administration, it's been widely, all of the, the newscasts are widely reported, so I'm not going to delve into policy issues, but I was interested in your uh, talking about at the NSA the, the mismatch between responsibility and authority. Yes. And in, in a lot of corporations today, that type of mismatch in 
uh, responsibility and, and authority is there in matrix organizations, and clearly that's very different than your role as the Secretary of State. Yes. What was that like to transition both working first from a, per a period of influencing others to one where you had kind of command and control? Yes, well, um, I like the latter a lot <laughs> better, to be frank about it. I told President Bush at one point, he said, you know, being National Security Advisor is like trying to make foreign policy by remote control. Can I get Secretary X to do this, Secretary Y to do that? And so you don't, as the National Security Advisor, own troops, as the Secretary of Defense does, or diplomats, as the Secretary of State does. Uh, so you, you have to work around and, and get people to agree. You're the coordinator. Uh, now, to be fair, I had something going for me as National Security Advisor. I had a very close relationship with the President. Everybody knew that. And that gave me uh, a kind of authority, but it was the reflected authority of the President, and you have to use that sparingly, because secretaries will ultimately become very suspicious of you if you're always saying, well, the President said, the President said. So uh, it's a tough job, but I enjoyed those years. Then you become Secretary of State, and you have line authority. But one other point that perhaps uh, people don't sometimes realize is the Secretary of State, of course, is also confirmed by the Senate. And so you have responsibilities not just to the President and the Executive Branch, but to the Congress as well. To testify before Congress, a responsibility you don't have as National Security Advisor. So to be held accountable. That's in part where some of the authority comes from. Multiple bosses, if you will. Multiple bosses, <laughs> if you will. So what was the most surprising aspect for you as Secretary of State? Anything that you learned that you didn't yes. expect? Well, even as National Security Advisor, because I've been four years National Security Advisor, I had no idea of the breadth of the Secretary of State's portfolio. I, I think I needed to apologize to Colin Powell because I had no idea <laughs> all of the things that he was doing. Because the Secretary of State is really the inbox for the world. If there's a problem out there, it's the Secretary of State that gets called, no matter how small that problem might be in, in uh, regards to American interests. If one of our allies has a problem, if some small country is in turmoil. And very often those issues don't really get dealt with by the President, they get dealt with by the Secretary of State. The compensation for that is that you get to represent this great country around the world. You get to see what America means to the world, and America really is uh, still a beacon for people of, of hope and freedom. Well, as, as you transition back into private life, back to being a professor at Stanford, what, what, did, what did you really miss most? You're one of the most powerful people in the world, and then you're back into private life. I assume you missed the plane. Well, except the plane at the other end, you have to get off and negotiate with the Palestinians and the Israelis, so the plane comes with a cost, remember that. Actually, I don't miss very much. I miss the people. I had wonderful colleagues uh, to work with. And of course, you, you miss the uh, authority to represent the United States, but eight years was plenty. And uh, I'm now a happy university professor again. I had been at Stanford a, a total of, I have been, 30 years. Now, they hired me when I was 12, obviously, but I have been a, a, a great, uh, it's been just great being back in, the, back in the classroom. You know, the wonderful thing about being a university professor is you can do for your students what a professor did for me. You can open up this world that they might otherwise never know, and uh, that's very exciting. So I love being back in the university uh, at this point in my life. Well, one of the things that I've noticed in watching various interviews of you is you're so positive. Somebody comes in and they're criticizing you. Uh, Donald Rumsfeld, you say, Secretary Rumsfeld's just being grumpy. Or uh, in the middle of uh, all of the 9-11 aftermath and all the crisis, whether it's criticism or crisis, you seem to always respond with positive and, and moving forward. And having read the first book and the second book, you can kind of see that theme of, of positive uh, impact of, of your parents and the way you grew up, but it seems to be just rooted deeply in Dr. Condoleezza Wright. Yes, I think it is, and, and partly growing up even in Birmingham, Alabama, my parents had me believe absolutely you may not be able to control your circumstances, but you can control your response to your circumstances. And if you're constantly pessimistic and you're constantly complaining, mm -hmm. you're doing yourself no good, you're doing no one else uh, any good. And so I do tend to be optimistic. I'm also optimistic because uh, I do have faith that that helps, to help you to be optimistic, and because I have seen so many impossible things seem inevitable in retrospect. How is it that a kid who grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, black kid, who couldn't go to a restaurant, couldn't go to a movie theater with her family, ends up as the Secretary of State? So, so many things that seem impossible 
in retrospect, seem inevitable. And if you remember that, then you will get through the toughest of times uh, in, in a way that helps you, but more importantly, helps those around you. That's fantastic. Two books have been written. The next is ahead of you. What yes. chapters are ahead for Dr. Rice? What, what is in the future? Well, I'm certainly going to teach at Stanford, and I love being at Stanford, and I plan to be at Stanford until uh, they don't want me any longer, and since I'm tenured, that's choices with me, <laughs> not with them. And uh, I'll keep teaching. I want to write a book about democracy. I think democracy, uh, we're seeing across the Middle East that authoritarianism is not stable, that it is universal for men and women to want to be free. But freedom is one thing. Democracy is quite another. Democracy is the institutionalization of freedom so that the strong don't exploit the weak, so it's not the tyranny of the majority, so that men and women have a way to peacefully change their circumstances. And that's a hard process about which I think we could have a conversation. And so I want to do that. I'll stay at, uh, at Stanford and play the piano and do music concerts and pull for the Stanford Cardinal, uh, which is having a pretty good year this year. That's right. Well, your, your positive outlook is, is certainly something that you can see throughout the book. And, and it, both of the books are really great because not only do they give insights into the thinking and the history and certainly what you were feeling, but also about you. And I think that it's, it's admirable. And it's no surprise that even though we live in a great country where you can overcome all those great odds, that it was you that did that because it's something that the seeds were kind of planted early and so it's wonderful to, to see that happen and we're delighted to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pleasure being with you. Thanks for listening.